Let's turn in our Bibles this morning to 1 Peter chapter 5 for our continued study in 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 5. First Peter chapter 5, I invite you to follow along as I read the first four verses of this fifth chapter. The elders who are among you I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed, shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, not as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for your holy word that gives us guidance and instruction. We believe that the Bible is the truth and that we have in our hands that which is inspired by your Holy Spirit, and we thank you that the inspired word has been written down and copied and preserved to this very day, that we might read, study, and know all that you have given to us. Father, we believe that this book is thus saith the Lord, so bring its truths home to our heart. Thank you for its guidance and direction, May we have ears to hear and hearts to obey your holy word. I pray with thanksgiving in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We saw last week that God has given leadership to his church, the body of Christ. And God is demonstrating his sovereignty among all the world. The chief place that God is demonstrating his sovereignty is in the church which is the body of Christ. Now, God is exercising his... ...authority. But we don't always see his authority over the nations right now. God is demonstrating his authority in the church, the body of Christ. We saw that from Ephesians chapter 1. And God works out his sovereign authority by his chosen method of leadership. There was apostles and prophets, evangelists and pastors and teachers, and to the local assemblies, those four that I just mentioned, apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastor teachers that we saw last week from Ephesians chapter 4, is for the building of the church, the body of Christ. And so we're talking about all saints from the day of Pentecost, when the church began, until the rapture, when God calls his church home to heaven. By the way, it won't be until the rapture that that church universal will ever be fully realized, all the saints together for the very first time. What a day that will be when we're all gathered together and we go to the judgment seat of Christ that we might be prepared as his bride to come back and reign with him. But God is demonstrating through local assemblies, churches like ours, those local assemblies, his leadership is worked out through elders and deacons. We looked at Philippians chapter 1, verse 1, the two offices. Peter here is writing to the elders. He considers himself an elder, and, and he's in a very humble way exhorting those who are the spiritual leadership in local assemblies, the elders, he's exhorting them. And we want to look today at those instructions. What are those instructions in verses 2 and 3? And we want to see it under two headings. What to do as a shepherd of the flock of God? What are we to do? And then also, Peter gives quite a bit of information on how we are to go about doing that. So God has given leadership, and he tells that spiritual leadership what to do, and he also gives details on how they're to go about doing that. And we want to see it together. First of all, notice verse 2 opens up with the word shepherd. Shepherd. Peter gives instructions to the elders that are among the churches to shepherd. The word here is to tend, to tend God's flock. And the, the idea of the church being a flock, that is, if you will, a herd of sheep, a flock, is, 
is a, an illustration that the Lord Jesus Christ used with the nation of Israel in the Gospel of John, chapter 10. Jesus spoke about being the door, and he talked about being the good shepherd. And he called those who followed him, that is, those who had faith, and they demonstrated that faith in hearing his voice, obeying him. Those were his sheep, his flock, all right? And uh, by the way, just look back one page at chapter 2, verse 25. First Peter 2, 25, Peter uses this same illustration or metaphor, if you will, when he speaks about the Lord Jesus and those who believe in him. He says in verse 25 of chapter 2, For you are like sheep going astray, but now have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Did you notice that word overseer? That's the word that we have here in the text. Now here in chapter 2, Peter is speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ, who's the good shepherd, and he is the overseer in his church. Now you come back to chapter 5, and so Peter is now speaking to those who are appointed by God to be those who will oversee in the church, which are elders, serving as overseers, verse 2, and notice again, verse 4, and when the chief shepherd appears, chapter 2, verse 25, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, when he returns, there will be an accounting and a reward for those who serve faithfully. Now, when Peter uses these terms in this metaphor, the Lord Jesus Christ is the one who started using that metaphor, calling all those who followed him his sheep, Peter, now I believe when he uses this word shepherd, the very first word in verse 2 uh, could be translated tend, is having in mind an interaction that he had with the Lord Jesus Christ just before he ascended to heaven, after Jesus' resurrection, before his ascension. And I would have you turn with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 21, please. John, chapter 21, records this interaction after Jesus' resurrection, and uh, it was an important interaction on many levels, and I believe it's the one that Peter has in mind when he tells the elders, shepherd or tend the flock. And this is going to help us to understand what our shepherds called to do, how are they to exercise the authority and the responsibility that God has given to them in the local assemblies. Here in John chapter 21, in the first uh, 18 verses or so, really down to verse 19, we have an account of one of the post-resurrection appearances of the Lord, which were sporadic. Uh, the disciples did not really know when Jesus was going to appear and then when he was just going to disappear. Just like in Luke 24, when the two men on the road to Emmaus all of a sudden, here comes the Lord Jesus walking on the road with them, but he disclosed his identity to them. They didn't know it was him. They walked the whole way without knowing and didn't even know it was the Lord until they sat. They invited Jesus to come and eat with them. When they sat for the meal and Jesus broke the bread and prayed, they knew it was him. And what did he do? He disappeared. Now, this is the way the Lord Jesus Christ appeared and disappeared after his resurrection only with believers, his disciples. He did not appear to unbelievers anymore after the cross, not until he returns to establish his kingdom on this earth will he appear to the world visibly. Well, he appeared to his disciples, and we get a sense of that because Peter here says, I'm going fishing in verse 3. I'm going fishing. And uh, there was a little bit of a sense of the disciples trying to figure out what they were doing, what the Lord wanted them to do. Well, his instructions for them were to wait. Wait in Jerusalem till the Holy Spirit would come, which would still be 10 days after Jesus' ascension. So here we are, one post-resurrection appearance before Jesus' ascension, before the Holy Spirit has been sent forth to enable and empower them for the ministry of going forth with the gospel. Peter goes fishing, and we are told in verse 2 that a number were with him. Thomas was there, Nathaniel was there, James and John were there, and two more of the disciples were there, and they go fishing, and Jesus appeared to them. We hear from the Lord in verse 5, after they fished all night and caught nothing, Jesus tells them something he did with Peter a long time ago, three and a half years earlier, when he first called Peter to be a disciple. Cast your nets on the other side of the boat, and the Lord miraculously filled those nets with fish, 
And, uh, and that's when John recognized, verse 7, and told Peter, it is the Lord. Now, when they got to shore with these fish and prepared their breakfast, and after they were finished eating, we're told in verse 15, Jesus, the risen Lord Jesus Christ, turned his attention to Peter. Here's the interaction that I believe Peter has in mind when he tells the elders to whom he is writing to shepherd the flock. Notice that Jesus, and I'm not going to go through this in depth and detail, three times asks Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Jesus, the first two times, begins with the Greek word agapao. Do you love me with that kind of love that God has for us? A self-sacrificing love that focuses on the needs of the one who's loved and is willing to sacrifice self to meet those needs. And Peter responds each time to the Lord. He was grieved as this went along in three successive questions because Jesus continues to ask. We see that grief in verse 17. The first time Jesus asked is in verse 15, and Peter said, yes, Lord, you know I. Now, when Peter responded, he did not use the word agapao that Jesus used. He used a different Greek word for love, phileo to have a tender affection, more, more commonly known as a brotherly love. In other words, Peter's in a very humble position because he denied the Lord three times. And now the Lord is specifically addressing that with Peter by giving Peter an opportunity to publicly proclaim his love for the Lord three times. It was a difficult thing for Peter, but wasn't it a gracious thing of the Lord to do for Peter? Peter was going to have a very important ministry and leadership. And the Lord Jesus wanted to exalt his servant, Peter, and God's approval of Peter in the eyes of those who were there. And that you know how well this was voiced abroad, how Jesus had this interaction with Peter. Peter responds, Lord, in a very humble way, you know I have tender affection for you. So Jesus progresses, Peter, do you love me, agapao? Lord, you know I have a tender affection for you. The third time, Jesus changed his word in verse 17. And when Jesus said, Simon, son of Jonah, he said, do you have tender affection for me? This is a beautiful expression about how God condescends to us right where we are. Because he loves us and he cares about us. And he wants to build us up. Now, we can't be built up if we're not in the right place of confession, repentance. But Peter was there. He was in that right place. He was sorry, genuinely sorry for what he did. And he loved the Lord. Jesus knew that. Peter says that on every occasion. And Peter responds again. Even though he was grieved, he said, you know that I love you. Now, Jesus responded to Peter in both, uh, in all three of these verses. In verse 15, Jesus said, feed my sheep, and in verse, feed my lambs. In verse 16, tend or shepherd, that's our word. Right there in verse 16, tend my sheep. And then the third time, Jesus said in verse 17, feed my sheep. In verse 15 and verse 17, the word feed is to provide food, a meal. Provide food for my sheep. But in the middle, Jesus says tend, which is a root word of the word shepherd provide shepherding type care for my sheep. I believe Peter had this interaction in mind, specifically verse 16, when Jesus said, Peter, I want you to tend my sheep. Come back now to 1 Peter chapter 5. This is now the command that comes forward to all of God's elders who are serving as overseers. We are to do what? Well, I believe we are to feed and to tend the sheep. That's what the Lord wants us to do. Peter here specifically instructs the leaders to tend God's sheep. How do we shepherd the flock? Well, it involves feeding, as we saw in John chapter 21, to provide the word of God. We're talking about spiritual food, to minister the spiritual truth of God's word, to feed the sheep. Uh, it's, it's Job who said, that he found God's word to be more important than his necessary daily food. And uh, it was Jeremiah who said, your words were found, 
and I did eat them, and they were to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. That was the prophet Jeremiah who said that. It was the apostle John who later on, after Peter writes this epistle, would be instructed to eat the little scroll, which would be sweet to his mouth and bitter to his stomach. What a wonderful picture that is of God's word, sweeter also than honey in the honeycomb. And yet, through the word of God comes admonition, exhortation, encouragement, edification. All that we need, we find in God's word. And so we are to feed on that. But to tend goes further. When you tend the flock, what does a shepherd do? Well, he leads the flock to where those pastures are. Uh, the, the shepherd is to tend the flock by leading them, leading them in God's ways of righteousness. The shepherd goes before and the sheep are to follow. And so the shepherd is to go in the ways of righteousness so that God's children will follow in the ways of righteousness. You'll see that emphasized in a, mon in a minute when we talk about how we are to do it. The, the shepherd is also to protect the flock. Back in John chapter 10, when Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, he also said, I am the door. I am the door. And the practice of a shepherd in the first century in that Middle Eastern part of the world was to bring the sheep at night into some kind of a fold. It may have been something that was built with rocks and had a good structure to it, but the door would just be an opening. It was just an opening. And the shepherd, after he brought the sheep into that fold, would then position himself in that opening. He would sit in the opening, protecting the sheep over the nighttime from any wolf or animal that would seek to enter in to ravage the flock. And so there was to be a, a protection to protect the flock from, God, from wolves. God's children are to be protected from those who seek to hurt and destroy. How do the wolves seek to hurt or destroy the flock of God's people? Well, there's lots of different ways. Satan has many, many different <coughs> methods. But one of them is through false doctrine. False doctrine. And the shepherds are to protect the flock by exposing and correcting false doctrine by the truth of God's holy word. A cross-reference for this, by the way, we won't turn there this morning, but for your own personal study, a cross-reference to this is in the book of Acts chapter 20. In the book of Acts chapter 20, the apostle Paul called the elders of the local assembly of Ephesus together, and he went down through many of these same things. He says it differently, but you will find these same points. And what does Paul call the believers in the local assembly there in Acts chapter 20? The same illustration that Peter is using here, the flock. And the elders are to serve as overseers, that is to shepherd the flock. So they lead the flock in God's way. They protect the flock from the wolves. And lastly, there needs to be a disciplining of the flock as well. A disciplining of the flock. You see, when the shepherd realizes that the sheep or a particular lamb has a rebellious heart that's going to go where it will harm itself, and do you know that sin, sin will harm you? Did you know that? We don't think about it when we're tempted to sin. When our own desires, James chapter 1, are tempted, we see sin as something very desirable because it's our desires. I want that. I like that. It appeals to my flesh. But it may be something that God does not want us to participate in. It's something that would be bad for us. Well, all sin is bad for us. You know, sin, I was reminded recently, will always lead you further than you ever intended to go. When you're tempted... You look here and say, well, I know that's over the line. That's something God says, thou shalt not. But, oh, it looks so good. It will make me feel good. I really want that. And we look here, and we don't realize that if I disobey and give in to my sin, the sin will lead me much further than I ever thought I would go. Because sin always leads to more sin. A classic example of that is Genesis chapter 4, Cain and Abel. Cain began by just choosing, I want to bring my kind of an offering to God. I'm not going to bring 
A bloody sacrifice, that's what Abel brought. Cain didn't do that. Cain brought the fruit of the ground. Why? Because that's what he wanted to do. And that's, at the outset, that's all Cain had in mind. Do you think that when Cain brought an offering to God, he had in his mind, and I'll kill my brother? No. Why would you bring an offering to God if you were planning to kill your brother? No. It was a series of steps. Because sin will always lead you much further than you ever thought you would ever go. Be careful. Sin also distorts the way we think. How do I go that far that I never back here thought I would go? Sin corrupts totally. The way we think, the way we act, what we say, sin is a very terrible thing. And so the leadership has a responsibility to do what? Discipline the flock. That's what the shepherd does. If there's a sheep who, when the shepherd with his rod brings back into the fold because they're going towards the cliff and the sheep continues, that lamb is going to continue to go in that direction, the sheep knowing that that lamb will fall to its own destruction is even willing to break, is even willing to break the leg of the lamb so that the lamb has to do what? Well, I know what you and I think. Hurt. Ouch! He did that to hurt me. No. The shepherd did it so that the lamb would have to rest on his shoulders to be brought wherever it had to go. And yes, it hurts. The Lord knows it hurts. And he intends the hurt for our good. How so? The lamb with the broken leg now is completely dependent upon the shepherd to take it wherever it would go. And the shepherd will only take that lamb where it should go. And it's an opportunity for that lamb to understand, I need to go where my Lord would have me to be. That can be a painful process. That can be a hard process. But God in love is willing to exercise that process in the life of his children. And he calls shepherds. Paul demonstrated this in First and Second Corinthians by calling on the assembly to bring forth discipline on one of the believers who had gotten into immorality. Why? Because sin not only leads to more sin, but sin also leavens the whole lump. It causes other believers to stumble and fall into sin. It's a serious thing. But it's a part of the tending the flock of God to minister, feed them, lead them, protect them, and to discipline them. This is what God wants the leadership to do. Now, let me just say very quickly here, we live in a day and a time where our culture in America is so wrapped up in personal freedom. Let me say an ideology of personal freedom. It's really not, if you study it, what, what our culture is calling liberty right now, sadly, is nothing more than license to sin because they say, I can abort children. That's my freedom. I can have relations, intimate ones, with whoever, whatever, whenever, wherever, however I want to. That's my freedom. The list goes on, doesn't it? That's not liberty. That's license to sin is what that is. We live in a context we live in a culture that is interpreting liberty as nothing more than license for sin. God's word warns against that in Galatians chapter 5. And so the culture brings pressure to bear on a local assembly where there's spiritual leadership who takes seriously, I need to feed the sheep. I need to lead the sheep in the paths of righteousness. I need to be careful to protect the sheep from those false teachers who would lead God's children astray. I need to be willing to discipline those who are going in a way that's going to lead to their spiritual peril and harm. And the world says, no, 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 no. You're, you're interrupting their liberty. We live in a culture that's willing to bring anyone who's in that kind of a healthy mindset of tending the sheep under the scrutiny of our civic courts. How dare you tell someone that to use that kind of language is sinful? There's even, there's even rumors of things that are taking place in uh, Canada 
in Great Britain where they're willing to walk, lock up spiritual leaders who are willing to speak the truth as God has said because they have a desire to honor the Lord by tending the sheep. Interesting time, isn't it? These are the times we live in. Why do I share all that? I'll tell you why. Because the leadership ought to have encouragement from the flock because they have understanding this is God's way and it's good for the assembly of God. Why? I'll tell you why. God is looking for a pure testimony. He wants the world to see his son in his people. And if we're living for sin, if we're confused with false doctrine, if we're full of movies and television and have nothing of God's word hiding in our heart, then we've lost the savor of our Savior. It's a sad day. May God help us to understand this is what God is looking for in his assembly. And this is what God calls his leadership to exercise by way of his authority in the assembly. Now, how are they to do it? How? We're, we're told here. Now, this is very important for leaders. And the assembly should be aware of this. This is written in scripture so that all the flock understands how they are to go about this spiritual ministry among the flock, God's people. It's very simple. Number one, they are not to do it by compulsion, verse 2. These are opposites the way. But willingly, not by compulsion, but willingly. Compulsion here means that there should not be a, a force to make someone do it. You shouldn't have to make spiritually mature men, you shouldn't have to make them serve in the office. Hmm, that's interesting. Seems like a lot of older Christians are so caught up with what they're trying to lay up and store in this world for themselves that they're not ready and willing, that's going to be the next word, to serve in the assembly. The leadership ought to do it with a heart that's willing. We see that here, not by compulsion, but willingly. Willingly here is in contrast, as I said, to the previous word, and it means that there should be some self-motivation. There should be some desire that the Lord is calling me to do this. I'm going to get involved and serve the Lord. Praise the Lord for willing men. Now, as I've said in our last message, I want to repeat again today, God does give both in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and in Titus chapter 1 the qualifications for his spiritual leadership. Because just because someone's been saved a long time or happens to be old does not mean they are necessarily qualified to serve in this role. And sadly, in too many a local assembly today, there are men who are serving as deacons and elders who have their own heart's desire at heart. It's a sad thing. There's a lot of local assemblies that don't have good, godly, spiritual leadership. Oh, they've got men who are willing to serve, but they're willing to serve because they can control how the monies are spent. They can decide what gets built, when it gets built, how it gets built. They get to decide who's going to be on that missionary panel. It's all about selfish desires. Too many local assemblies have men like that. Lord, help us. We need godly men who are interested in what God wants among his flock, the church, the body of Christ. Not by compulsion. There should be a willingness. And they should be volunteering, willing to do it. And they should be spiritual men. Notice Peter goes on. The third word here that we have is not for dishonest gain. The fourth word is eagerly. So let me just put it this way. Honestly. Do it honestly. Not by compulsion, number one. But number two, willingly, that is with the volunteering. Here I am, I'm ready. But honestly, now when we say that honestly, what do we mean? Well, it's a wonderful translation in our English, not for dishonest gain. In other words, leadership should not be fleecing the flock. Now, you need to know something. In order for Peter to say this, it is true that in the first century, there was some remuneration that was going on, not only for the pastor, like is so common in our churches in America today, but leaders, they were remunerated. There's an, a rightful, honest 
uh, uh, biblical remunerating for those who serve the Lord. And that's correct, and that's right, and that's proper. But there's two sides to this. It should be, as we read in 1 Timothy 3, 8, you don't serve because you're greedy for the money. 1 Timothy 3, 8. That's wrong. That's carnal. And sadly, there's too much of that going on. It should not be. That's repeated again in Titus chapter 1 and verse 7. Not greedy for money, but it is biblical for men who teach the word to be remunerated, let's go to 1 Timothy 5. Would you turn there with me, please? And, and it seems to me, it's, it's just an evidence of the times that we live in. The, what, I'll put it this way. I listened to a pastor say, what I'm about to show to you was already in your Bible. What I, I'm not showing you something new. This is already in your Bible. But it seems like today... We've got so much confusion. We're, we're experiencing extremes on both sides. We have men who are preparing for the ministry, but they won't go serve a church of 20 people. Why? I can't support my family. Now, having said that, I would like to say that's a very real consideration because there are men who are serving local assemblies that have only 20 people, and it's a shame that the assembly is not caring for their pastor. We, we've got both sides of this going on. There's no biblical balance that the scriptures present. It ought to be. God wants it to work and be in a, a beautiful presentation of his church. Notice 1 Timothy chapter 5. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, I want to draw your attention to verses 17 and 18. P, uh, John, Paul, I'll get the right apostle. Paul writes, let the elders who rule well, be counted worthy of, do you see the next word? Double honor. That means not meagerly, it should be a double blessing. They're worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. So in the first century, it wasn't only those who taught the word of God. We're familiar with that in America today. Usually we support our pastor and 1 Timothy 5, 17, I'm going to read verse 18 as well. They support this. It's right for those who give of their time and energies to studying, preparing, and teaching the word of God to be supported by those who are taught the word of God, by those who teach it. Verse 18, for the scripture says, you shall not muzzle the ox, an ox, while it treads out the grain. And the laborer is worthy of his wages. That's a quote from the Lord Jesus Christ, by the way. When Jesus quoted from that passage, when he sent out those who went on his behalf. Now, when they went out, what was the expectation? A place to live, sleep. They were moving, so it was a place to stay. This should be a provision of some place for those who are coming in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to give his word that they should be taken care of with a place to sleep, Food, there should be food provided for them just to care for their needs. You don't have to build them a mansion on 30 acres of land with an ocean side view and 13 cars and six motorcycles. No, that's greedy for dishonest gain. Now, it's not hard to explain these things, but I want to tell you in America today, both things are going on. Where's the biblical sense of God said we have a responsibility as the flock to take care of those in our midst who God has specially chosen and equipped and, and they are qualified and so they're serving. We, we support to make sure that our elder is taken care of. We want to do that to the glory of God. Why? Because God says so. 1 Timothy 5, 17 and 18. Now we come back to 1 Peter 5. Now that I'm done my little side thing there. You have to say it because there's so, so much misunderstanding today. Yes, we should support our pastor. It's biblical to do that. And by the way, not to make him suffer. Is he going to get another meal tomorrow? No, that's not worthy of double honor, is it? No, to take care of the pastor. And by the way, I struggle sharing these things because God's called me to shepherd. But I've got to teach God's word, and I want you to know I don't do it for me. I'm telling you honestly, I do it for if the Lord tarries whoever comes after me, that the Lord would work in his assembly to do what is biblical, right, and honest to do. And I also do it 
because if there are others who hear this and they really don't know what to do, God's word says you should take care of those who teach the word of God. Supply. But now speaking to those who are in that place, 1 Peter chapter 5, these men should be doing it not to gain an advantage. Don't fleece the flock. What if, and I'm thankful I was asked this question, when I went to my ordination council, I was asked, if you are called by God to serve in a local assembly and they cannot provide you with an income, I was asked, will you go? I'm thankful I was asked that question. Do you know I had to sit there for a second and think? By God's grace, I will go. Because it's not the flock that takes care of the shepherd. Who really takes care of the shepherd? Our Heavenly Father. The same one who takes care of you takes care of his servants. Now, it's his method to use the flock to minister to the shepherd, but it's the chief shepherd who takes care of the needs of his servant. By God's grace, I will go. And that ought to be the heart of everyone who serves. If they never give me a penny, it doesn't matter. I'm serving the Lord God. Don't do it for dishonest gain. No, do it honestly. That is, trusting in the Lord. I'm going to serve him and not for material advantage. Why? Verse 4 tells us the heavenly reward is coming for those who have a right heart, isn't it? Sometimes people say to me, do they provide you with a retirement? I say to them, my retirement is out of this world. <laughs> May we have a heart to serve God. Honestly, not for dishonest gain. And may the assembly sense the biblical responsibility they have to honor the Lord with how they support those that God has given to them to shepherd. Now, the opposite word, honestly, but eagerly. We are to do it eagerly. We see, uh, and, and how are we to do it eagerly? Well, the word here means to, uh, there should be a moving of the Holy Spirit in the heart of the leader. There should be a spiritual desire to do this. And, and really, I'm speaking to, I've said, if there's uh, older men in the assembly who have been saved and are qualified and are spiritually mature, if this subject comes up, you ought to examine your heart. Is this God's leading in my life? There ought to be a spirit motivation. There is a call of God. There is a call of God. And there ought to be a sensitivity. Is this God's leading in my life? Now, that doesn't mean if I don't sense it or feel it, I say no. It means if I don't sense it or feel it, I take it to the Lord in prayer, especially if you've been asked. If you've been asked, say, I will take this to the Lord in prayer, because if your heart's in the right place, the Spirit of God will lead, so that there can be an eagerness, a desire in the heart. Well, I'm not qualified for this. I can honestly tell you that. But by God's grace, because he has given me his holy word and he's given me his Holy Spirit, I will do what God has called me to do. I'll serve. Yes, I'm willing. That's what there ought to be. Not by compulsion, but willingly. Do it honestly, that is, not for dishonest gain, and do it eagerly. Notice now, number five is do it humbly. Do it humbly. Nor as being lords over those entrusted to you. Overseers are called to lead by example, not by authority. You see, we've already seen that this authority is God's authority in his local church. The spiritual leaders, the overseers, the elders are not the authority. They are merely a rung in God's ladder. That's all you are is a step. And by the way, since you're only a step in God's ladder of authority, don't feel bad when you get stepped on. Bear up. That's what God wants us to do. Bear up. Because sometimes we get stepped on. But remember, God's the authority. It's a chain of authority to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's over the church. And so we do it humbly. The world does it by exercising authority. As I said before, there's CEOs and CFOs, and I don't know all the acronyms for all the positions in business America, world business for that matter today. That's not how it's supposed to be in God's church. 
In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 20, verses 25 through 27, let's turn there. Matthew, chapter 20. The Lord Jesus Christ spoke to his disciples, and he shared with them his heart when it came to this subject of leadership. Now, the situation is an interesting one that caused some strife among the disciples because in Matthew, chapter 20, James and John's mother came asking for great authority for her two sons. She even knelt down before the Lord in verse 20, and she wanted that Jesus would give them positions of leadership on his left hand and on his right hand in the kingdom. Lord Jesus said, you don't know what you're asking, but it's not mine to give anyways, it's my heavenly Father's. Isn't that wonderful how Jesus demonstrated that humility? It's God the Father's to do. And so the disciples were a little bit upset about all of this, And the Lord Jesus took it as a teaching example. Verse 25, Jesus called them to himself and he said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. It has been that way since the fall. It is that way now in every place and in everywhere. It's all about power and it's all about authority. Who has the power and who can exercise it? But Jesus said in verse 26, it shall not be so among you. I'm giving authority to you, but not to exercise it like a king or a lord or something like that. Why am I giving you this authority? You do have authority over the flock. For what purpose and for what reason? Here it is. Whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. That's the word diakonos, to minister, to actually do the work of whatever is needed. Diakonos, but it goes further. Jesus says in verse 28, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. That's the word doulos, the verb douleo. A slave as a servant and a slave, and Jesus is our example. Why did Jesus come? To give his life a ransom for many. Spiritual leadership The ideal that Jesus has given to them is to serve as a minister. And that's just a servant who does the work to serve as he did as a slave, seeing those whom you serve, esteeming them better than yourself. Wow. May God help me. May God help us to appreciate it. It's a wonderful thing. And let me tell you, if we get a hold of God's way of leadership... It will demonstrate our Savior, Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 20 and verse 28. Coming back to 1 Peter chapter 5, we are to do it humbly, which means servant leadership, not dictatorship, not some kind of a board that calls the shots, but servants who are willing to get themselves dirty and minister on behalf of Jesus Christ to the sheep. And then lastly, they are to do it genuinely. Notice The word here in verse 3 is by being examples to the flock. I'm titling that genuine. Do it genuinely, an example. Why do I choose the word genuine? Because the word here in verse 3, but by being example, is the word tupos. Now, the last time I wanted to go over the word tupos, I hurt myself because I used a little uh, illustration, and so I'm not going to do it again. I don't know how many of you remembered it. I brought a piece of wood. I brought a hammer. And I brought a little set, and I hammered into the piece of wood. I just chose a piece of wood that was too small. (laughs) And so it gave me a blood blister when I I hit it. So I'm just going to ask you to think of a typewriter today. Tupos, you get the word type, our English word type. Tupos, type. Typewriter, that which writes type. What does a typewriter do? Well, our young people today don't really know. (laughs) Nobody uses a typewriter anymore. A typewriter has a typeset, one letter for every letter in the alphabet, plus the punctuation, whatever, and there's a ribbon with ink on the ribbon, and then there's a piece of paper. And the type is, on the old-fashioned ones, is the hammer. Then they went to balls and different things, wheels, but there was always a typeset, which was the letter, and it would strike the paper with the ink in between. That's what a typewriter does. The tupos would sometimes be something that would be engraved in by just striking the blow into the paper, and it would leave just a little indentation. With the typewriter, it leaves ink. And then what you see is the type. Well, in this case, in the Greek word, the tupos, 
is that which strikes the blow and leaves the example, all right, the anti-type, which is just the opposite, but it's what is the representation. In other words, leaders are called to lead in what kind of a way? By example, by that which they were struck with. You see, what's a wonderful thing here is you can take that indentation, if you were to strike a blow into something soft enough, you could then pour molten wax in it, and you could let it dry, and you could pull out the same thing. Isn't that wonderful? That's God's design. By example, who's the example? Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 11.1 1, when he said, Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. 1 Corinthians 11.1. 1. What was Paul doing? The word follow there is to mimic. That's a different word, mimic. To mimic, to exactly represent in the same way the one that you are representing. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. The two pos. Spiritual leadership is to be struck in the pattern of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ so that they can now serve genuinely in the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. An example would be serving humbly, not as lords over every single thing on this list would be an example because we are to serve in the example of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, may God stimulate our hearts. Spiritual leadership is a very serious thing with the Lord and his church. We ought not to have churches with no leadership. God desires for there to be leadership. But we ought not to have worldly, carnal leadership God desires for there to be spiritual leadership that's serving in the place of, on behalf of whom? Our head, Jesus Christ. May God bless our assembly with an understanding of this truth, and may he bless our assembly with the wonderful exercise of God's authority through true spiritual leadership in his church. May God bless all the churches with this. I pray let's look to him. Father in heaven, this truth is so practical, so very, very real, and yet in our sinful flesh, it is so very distant from the desires of our sinful hearts. And we see not this model worked out, but so often we see men who are in it for their own interests, whether it's dishonest gain or to be lords over, for whatever the reasons are. Father, we, we repent of this and pray that you would move among your children, that we once again would see the blessed, simple instructions in your word that are so spiritually profound. What a privilege it is, Father, to follow the example of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so we confess, Lord, we are not sufficient for these things. How can we mimic our Savior? And to this we hear the answer of your holy word, Father, you have made us able ministers. And so I pray that we would not look to self, but we would look to the word of God. How I pray that we would not look to self, but we would look to the spirit of God, that you may demonstrate your authority in your church, that the world may see Jesus Christ. Father, this is our desire and our prayer, and we give you thanks that you will accomplish it as we obey and present ourselves to you a living sacrifice. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.